When it started this? Um, that means that good afternoon. How y'all doing? Very good. <laughs> Is anybody out there? Do I hear crickets? No. Thanks for being here. This, uh, my name is, is Christopher Dyer. I'm the Dean of, of Academic Affairs here at uh, Missouri State University West Plains. Today we have a special guest speaker all the way from uh, Roanoke Falls, Virginia, uh, Ms. Jess, Jessie Howard. Uh, Jesse is a district conservationist for, for the National Resource Conservation Service in the state of Virginia. Um, she is a B, has a BS in environmental science and policy with a minor in soil science. She graduated from the university in 2000 and, when was it, Jess, 2010? 2009. But she actually began her career with NRCS in 2005 uh, as an intern and was actually a an employee before she even graduated. Uh, Jesse graduated magna cum laude in her class. She's also the recipient of the, uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Come on, he's, he's a famous, he was a famous congressman. He was the Secretary of Interior. What is his name? Udall, yeah, Morris K. Udall, Young Environmentalist Award. Uh, she won that as a national award and was also a participant in the Envirothon. She won the Envirothon for her state and has been in Missouri before because the Nationals were held in Springfield, Missouri. Actually at Temple Hall where she gave us the similar talk you'll hear today, yesterday for the campus up in Springfield. Um, she's worked in Hawaii, North Carolina, not North Carolina. She's visited North Carolina. She's worked in Hawaii, Rhode Island, and the state of Virginia where she presently serves as a district conservationist. Um, she's married to James and she has a dog named, a psycho dog named Lucy. I guess that's an important fact, but uh, without much ado, let's, let's say hello to Jesse Howard. At least I cut the dog right. <laughs> Pasture productivity, crop productivity, soil erosion, soil quality, water quality, 
those sorts of things. And we write a conservation plan that is targeted to address all those issues. And whether the plan is implemented or not, we're there to provide the technical assistance to provide the landowners to get to the point where they'd like to address those resource concerns and improve the profitability of their operation. And so it's, again, a volunteer program that come, people come to us to work, and we are not ready to write it. And I know that people will be very hesitant when the government's around. So just a quick history of the agency. Um, you guys do recall the Dust Bowl era, the stock market crash in 1929, and the, um, Basically, this the whole portions of the country, the Midwest, we are farming intensive agriculture with very minimal knowledge about how to do that sustainably, which created the subsequent Dust Bowl, which had a large part in the Depression. And um, you saw you know, this kind of soil degradation, you know, soil erosion to the extreme. And then you had fewer Dust Bowls that would just black out the sky. And this is Hugh Hammond Bennett, and he is single-handedly, in my opinion, the man that has done the most for the natural resources of our country than anybody else in the history of the country. That's my opinion. So I know that's a big statement, but he really understood the importance of soil. And he saw what was happening with the Dust Bowl and the consequences on the supply chain, on the economy, on the culture that became the legacy of America. And he understood that if we don't protect our soil, nothing happens. We can't eat, animals can't live, nothing can happen. So he went to Congress and he lobbied and he fought and he lobbied and he fought and he was able to squeak out some funds to create the Soil Erosion Service, which at that time started providing technical assistance to landowners to figure out how to keep that soil where it is and not in the air. And eventually that became the Soil Conservation Service and eventually that became what is now the Natural Resources Conservation Service as a more holistic approach to resource management. And Hugh Hammond Bennett finally got his point across to Congress. He was fighting for funds and fighting for funds. And he was on the Capitol building one day saying, this is why we're in a depression, because we are not managing our resources properly. And right as he said that, a huge dust bowl came and encompassed the entire Capitol building and blocked out the sky. And finally, they gave him the funds to establish the Solar Road Service. So he's kind of my hero. So he created this really awesome agency. We are 14,000 strong in employment, and we have a $14 billion budget, so big money. Um, we have conservation programs that we work with landowners to provide technical assistance through wildlife and farm conservation plans, and then we have cross-share funds to implement those plans. Um, they're not 100% cross-share, you know, they're somewhere between 50 to 75, but they're intended to help landowner implement the practices and improve the profitability of the farm and address all those water quality and herd health issues. So the, the farm and wildlife plans can be for quail habitat. It can be improving your grazing system for a more intensive grazing rotational system to improve forage production, improve soil quality. So a real broad spectrum. And the best part about the job is you get to go out to farms and you get to spend a good deal of your time walking the land with producers. You get to walk a lot. You get to learn the names of their dogs. You get to meet their favorite cow. You get to meet all the children. You get to meet their parents. You get to meet so many generations. And you really become a part of the family. And within 10 minutes of meeting these people, you know their financial information. You know their property history. You know all the cultural resources that are available. And it really is an incredible experience. And that's the best part of being able to work for this agency is we're not, again, not regulatory volunteer agency that is able to really help producers at the end of the day. So we're out in the land, walking the land. Has anybody here had experience with NRCS? Okay, any other group? Okay, partner, right? Yeah. Talk about you later. So we work with landowners, address their resource, identify their resource concerns, create a plan, and then we have to find a way to implement that plan. So we have engineers on staff that teach everyone else how to do engineer designs, and eventually we won't do engineer designs. And those engineer designs include putting in a stream crossing, putting in a water system, um, putting in a waste storage structure, terraces, grass waterways, systemic pivot irrigation, so many different things that you learn and you just develop this incredible knowledge. And it's all while you're on the job, you become a specialist in so many different things. It's really empowering. So we do, we have ground penetrating radar um, technology we use, we have total stations, we have really innovative um, engineering, we use AutoCAD, so those are the, and we also do everything by hand, so if people are afraid of technology, there are other ways to kind of go about things. And partners, who we have in the back, which is really great, 
Um, every state has different partners. Um, wildlife, um, Wild Turkey Federation, Ducks Unlimited, Trout Unlimited, the Nature Conservancy, all of the state Department of Natural Resources or the state Department of Environment and Quality, the conservation districts. Partners, partners, <coughs> partners, partners. And that's how we get our job done because you guys develop relationships with the partners. And so you work with so many different people. You work with people that, that are within the agency and then you have this whole family of other people. You have your landowners and then you have your partners. And they're an integral part of getting the job done. So this was a dam restoration project in Rhode Island I worked on. And um, these each people person standing there was from a different entity. So this is why I chose that picture. It may not seem very significant, but it really is. When you talk about you know, permits and everything coming from this kind of level, the a level of coordination and the skills you develop in terms of communication is substantial. And this this was a dam that we were removing from one of the historic mills that was one of the first in the Industrial Revolution. So it had a lot of cultural history. So we're trying to find a way to continue to keep that cultural history while also putting in a way for the fish, the anadromous fish, to continue to go to their original spawning habitat. So this was part of it putting in a fish ladder. And Prior to that, people would show up at that dam every year and throw the fish over the dam so that they could get up and spawn, so it was really remarkable. So it's been a partnership in many years, and it finally came to fruition in terms of creating this ladder, this fish ladder. So no more growing fish, they can get it on their own. And the, the, another really awesome part of the job is you get to work a lot with schools, students. Um, you get to go take time and go in and you know, take kids out to the farm. And through educational outreach, this was a picture shown in Hawaii when I was out in Hawaii, and we had about a thousand students come through in about six hours and just talking to them about soil and water quality. And it's really fun because they don't, you know, they're like, why does the water turn red? Well, you need to have vegetation out there, and they get really excited about water modules and different kind of um, things that we set up for them to play with. So this is probably what you guys are most interested in finding out. These are the qualifications to work as a soil conservationist. Um, you need 30 hours in a natural resource ag related science and you need an overall degree relating to agricultural environmental science. Um, 12 of those 30 hours need to be in a soils and plants combination and at least three need to be in soils. And I've met so many people that come through with ag degrees or environmental science degrees or wildlife biology degrees that could qualify and come in and work for the agency but they don't have that one soils class. And it's always that one soils class, so take a soils class. <laughs> because if you don't come work for NRCS, maybe one day you will, and you'll have all the qualifications necessary. Because I've seen hundreds of people that can't come to work for us because of one class. So I really recommend that. And if you don't come work for us, you might develop a true appreciation for soils, which is the foundation of everything, and close to my heart. Um, so I really recommend that. But and I'll talk a little bit about the structure of the agency as well. So. First you have the soil conservationist, then you have a, a variety of other folks that provide technical assistance to the soil conservationist. And from there you go up to a district conservationist. And the district conservationist oversees counties. And here in, in, um, here in this county, the DC is right up the road, her name is April, and she oversees Ozark, Douglas, and Howell. Those are her counties. So she's a pretty awesome resource. She's really open, really friendly, and a really awesome person to talk to. So I recommend looking her up, and I can provide you her contact information. So then it goes up to the DC position, which is where I am. And then up there it goes to the boss above that, which oversees large portions of states. And then you have the people that oversee states, and then you have our chief. So it's a line command system, and it's kind of military mentality in that you don't jump between commands. Um, the younger folks, such as myself, tend to break convention a little too much, but I send emails to people, maybe I shouldn't when I'm upset about things and want to get some change happening, but um, that's kind of how the structure of the agency is created. So there are other jobs available. The soil contact positions, there's no credit requirements. So with some background and some sort of ag or engineer um, experience, you can get into a soil contact position pretty easily. Soil scientist positions are highly coveted. Um, basically, you need a certain soil, um, you need more soils classes than just one. And there's one soil scientist for each state, and then there's a couple of others. And has anybody ever used a soil survey? Every hand should be up in the air. Okay. Well, the house, thank you. <laughs> um, the house that you're living in, 
food that you're, that's grown for you, all of that was used with technical information from the Soil Survey. And basically every single acre in this country has been walked, traversed, and mapped by soil scientists from this agency. And basically they've created these books that tell you anywhere you go, it's going to tell you the kind of soil there and the limitations for construction, crop use, anything you need to know about that soil to do whatever you want on it. So if you're looking for a house and you're going to buy a house, I'd look at the soils, look for a high water table, make sure that you're not running yourself into some problems. Really important resource, it's even an app now, Web Soil Survey. They have really gotten technologically advanced, so that is pretty awesome. Maybe you guys are as excited as I am about that. Okay, so rangeland management specialist. This is a person that's going to work out in the range area, Montana, Colorado. They really get to work with the plants and the animals and create ecological systems, combining with grazing systems. And that's really what a range specialist does. And then biologist positions, which is somebody with a biology degree, and they come and provide technical assistance to the line staff. And basically, bird identification, plant identification, and, um, insurance that were within limits of the Environmental Protection Act for all the native and threatened species. So they provide a lot of wonderful technical systems. So the benefits are the same with any federal position. So the next few slides I'm going to talk about are in reference to any federal job you'd like to get. Um, there's a lot of different agencies that have a lot of really awesome opportunities that I, I implore you to search whatever your degree options may be. Um, but for a savings plan, is the equivalent of a 401k. So they match you up to 5%, which is really awesome. And you can put in up to 17000 a year into your 401k. And that's really something that, as a student, you may not think about that. But if you can get into an internship now that has permanent employment, you can start for your retirement now. You can retire as early as like 48. So it's really something you should think about now, in my opinion. Because <laughs> retiring young seems like you have the rest of the world to really enjoy, the rest of the time to enjoy the world. So. Full health and dental, flexible savings plan. Um, some of you may know about, it's basically a bank account that's set up in your name that takes money out pre-tax, and that money you can use for health care or child care. So you're paying you no know, tax on your child care, which people with children, they don't have a sense of child care can be, and that can knock you down into a lower tax bracket to so on your taxes. Paid holidays, paid sick and annual, basically a full generalized packet. So again, these are opportunities that are the same for any federal agency. These are federal overall arching themes. And Obama is changing these right now. So this is what's being advertised right now, but this may be subject to change. Um, but this is the Student Career Employment Program, and this is what I came through. And I, right out of high school, I got into this position and stayed with it until I graduated and then walked into a job without any other thought. So it's permanent. You need to have 640 hours within the agency, working between summers or even working while you're still in school on days that you're not in class. Um, full benefits, so when I was a student, I had all my holidays paid, which was really awesome. The first Christmas I had, I was sitting there and I was like, oh crap, I'm getting paid right now, this is awesome. So if you guys have ever gotten to that point yet, it's really rewarding to get paid for a holiday. Um, it's, again, a guaranteed job upon graduation and well, be at a GS3 level with one to three years, one to two years of college, and a GS4 level with three years. So that's kind of the idea of the pay that you receive. <coughs> this is the student temporary employment program, and this is just typically summer positions. And they hire these around a lot, um, anywhere from here. Well, any any, any state in the country is going to be hiring these these folks pretty soon. Um, so I'll definitely keep an eye out. I'll provide you all the websites to look for these positions, but. Um, Basically, these are going to be advertised anywhere and anywhere in the country, and they will provide, you know, depending on how you negotiate with them, they'll provide travel for you to go work in other parts, like I went to Hawaii. And they also usually provide some sort of living stipend to pay for rent and that kind of stuff. Um, again, leave benefits while you're in that position, so like 4th of July if you're working the first summer. And again, the pay. So those are some students helping out, and they're really excited. Don't they look excited? Alrighty, so some other things to consider, and I'm here to kind of talk up NRCS because we're really looking for some young hot blood to bring in at a, you know, best of the best to bring in at the entry level to really develop your skills and develop you to be a leader, hopefully one day. So some awesome benefits is you can work anywhere in the country or you can work right in your backyard at home in your own home county. Um, it, it, NRCS has a presence in every county in the country, like I said before, including American Samoa, Guam, all the territories. Um, Puerto Rico, so if you're interested in a warmer climate. 
votes are available for you. Um, it's public service, and I kind of mentioned before, you really become an integral part of your community. community. As a district conservationist, I'm at all the local meetings, I'm at all the local farm bureau meetings. I, I walk into, you know, um, some, uh, I walk into all the stores, and people know my face, and it's, you become a very important part of the bonds of the community between all the different partners and all the different um, landowners. Like, I have two landowners that hate each other because they have different concepts on how agriculture should work. And I've worked really hard over the past year to get these people to understand each other. And they can actually be in the same room. And they're starting to learn from each other. And that's really what this is all about, is the transfer of knowledge between people. So there's a lot of independence. Um, basically, you create your own schedule. You come in when you want. If you come in too late, you can stay late. And um, really flexible. It's a, we usually start early because we mirror the schedules of farmers, but we tend to work late, so we also <laughs> mirror on the, the, the late ends as well. And um, again, like I said, a lot of on-the-job training. Our agency is the top 10, one of the top 10 agencies to provide training. Um, this year alone, I think I'll be gone for 14 weeks on training. And that can be a lot if you have a family, and that's kind of something you should consider. But we are the technical agency for anything agriculture. Farmers are coming to us to learn about the new technologies, what they can do to improve their profitability, what they can do to improve their, to protect their resources. So you need to know a lot of stuff. You have to be a jack of all trades and a master of everything. And it's really empowering at the end of the day to know that the agency cares that much about the quality of what we're providing landowners to send you on so many trainings. So that is changing a little bit with budget, but they're just trying to make it more creative ways of training, like sending, instead of flying people across the country, they're trying to localize trainings for needs in specific areas. And again, like I said, we're helpers, not regulators. We're non-regulatory, and I think <laughs> I had a, I came into the district that I'm working in, and the DC before me was not well liked. And it was very hard walking in and trying to make people understand that they don't have to hate me because they hated him. And there was a sign at a gas station owned by a farmer that said, um, oh gosh, we're from the government. Oh, oh, fearful words, we're from the government and we're here to help. So that was his impression of <laughs> what we were there to do. So it really is up to the person to make sure that whatever services we're providing are the best that they can be. And it's all about customer service at the end of the day. Um, and again, 35% 30, of our workforce will retire in the next five years. We have a very old workforce for NRCS. It's people that came in the 70s and 60s and have stayed on. And a lot of them, we're going to have a huge outflow of knowledge. And we need young people that are ready to pick up and really learn as much as they can before we lose all that knowledge. And it's going to leave a huge gap. So we need people that have really broad minds that can pick up on things quickly and really run with it. <coughs> And this is a picture about two hours north of here at a demonstration that NRCS did for some grazing. And this was um, in Kansas City at a conference in 2010. It was like the last big hoorah conferences we had before that said no more, the budgets are too bad. <laughs> so Kansas City was like kind of idolized by raise line. So, which brings to, I meant to mention before, this is my fourth time in Missouri. The first time was in my wonderful, has anybody ever heard of the marathon? Yeah. So a marathon is like a super dork club. Yeah. So it's basically like academic decathlon for environmental stuff in high school. And um, you go through it and you compete at a state level and eventually if you win, you can go up to a national level. Well, we had three teams for Rhode Island because Rhode Island is like the size of this county. So we won. And we're like, yeah, we beat two other teams where most teams have to be like 200 to get to the national level. So anyway, we were excited either way. So it was here in Missouri, which was really cool. So we spent a lot of time learning about the Ozarks and about prescribed burn and the cave systems and the first topography. So it's funny that I know so much about this specific area. And it's really cool to be here and kind of learn more about the cultural side of it from you guys. And then in 2000, 2009, I was here for a solo doping competition, which was even more dorky because it was in college. So we were here. Um, and soil pits determining the soil characteristics. And that was over in Springfield where we had the big ceremony for that. So I've been here a lot to learn about the soils and resources. For whatever reason, I keep coming back to Missouri. So there are special emphasis groups um, as part of the Equal Employment Opportunity Act and all this other stuff that the government wants to ensure that there's you know plenty of different diversity within the workforce. So these are just some groups, and anybody can be part of any one of these groups. Um, I'm part of quite a few of them, and it's basically a networking tool. And I've created a, quite an extensive network within the agency using becoming part of these organizations. And I implore you, 
what, whatever agency you may work with, whatever private sector you may work with, whatever it may be, I would look out the professional organizations related to those. Every agency, every organization, every private sector will have those, um, whether it be you know, anything. And um, get connected, that's where you're gonna meet the leaders, that's where you're gonna be able to get those jobs without interviews, that's where you're gonna be able to really hook in with the things that are available for you. Just really have to create a network for yourself because that's really the only way to get by in the economy the way it is now. So I'm gonna drag that thing on. So I'm just gonna try to talk quickly so I don't keep you guys here all afternoon, but the first place I was employed was Rhode Island, and this was a training day that we had to look at some soils. And I know here you guys have a lot of kudzu and multi-floor rose problems and whatever other pests are present in your pasture systems. Um, this was an invasive species removal project I did up in Rhode Island for purple loosestrife using biological control methods, which is this little beetle. Um, but NRCS has a lot of pest management and brush management to help landowners deal with those problems that are impacting productivity and destroying the natural resources, the vegetation, the vegetative natural resources. We do a lot of mapping. Um, you have to come to the agency ready to learn about a lot about technology. Um, we I probably spend about two hours a day using GIS, creating maps. Um, we need to create maps to understand what we're planning out there, looking at the topography and the soils for the landowners to understand as well what we're talking about in that communication process. So GIS is a big thing. We use a lot of technology, which is fun. We get to learn a lot. And so make we have soils is thing on the coastal states they're starting to map out the soils um, that are underneath the aquatic systems within um, within the land masses that aren't too far out from the shore but just trying to understand what's going on out there for aquaculture purposes to improve um, the ability to grow mussels or scallops or wonderful delicious shellfish. So so and these are again are some field tools. These are really outdated field tools actually that G GPS unit is now about this big and can come into like one inch. And that thing was crazy large. And this was in Hawaii, you know, surveying using walkie talkies. Some more aquaculture pictures. This is from Rhode Island. Um, basically, we put out these large shell masses and put the small little, oh gosh, I wish I knew more about the terminology. I wasn't involved with this too much, but I thought this picture was really cool. But basically, the little guys grew on the pieces of rocks and stone that we put out there. And, and that, so in 2008, I went to Hawaii, which is an opportunity for anybody if they're interested in going anywhere in the country. And um, this is Hanalei Valley. Has anyone been to Hawaii? Yay! <laughs> Hawaii is a very special place for anybody that's been there. But anyway, um, if any of you are familiar with Puff and Magic Jack and the song, um, this is Hanalei Valley, um, and the song was originally written about this valley, um, contrary to popular belief about what else it may be written about. But um, so this is Hanalei Valley, and this is Puff's head. And his body wraps around and his tail goes out to the ocean. And it's always really foggy in this valley. There's clouds, so it looks like smoke. So that was Puff. So, anyway, a little piece of Jeopardy trivia if you guys ever make it there. You guys are asked that. So these are the Nene geese. Um, we do a lot of um, endangered species habitat restoration work. And in Hawaii, we're working with the Nene geese. Um, here in, in Missouri, you're working a lot with um, quail habitat developing rare and declining species and rare and declining habitats is a large portion of what we do to bring back that natural heritage. Um, a lot of on-site soil determinations. We can't do anything until we know our resources. And this is Waimea Canyon. It was basically the Grand Canyon of Hawaii. And they were doing a lot of restoration work trying to bring back the native vegetation in those areas. And they, there's this, this um, tree that had invaded from Australia that was killing out and suffocating all the natural vegetation. So they would go take helicopters and work with the local DNR offices and drop these large chemical balls onto these trees to kill them. So one of the soil cons in the office would always go out and do that. And I always said, no way, because I get sick to my stomach just driving. So I'd be vomiting everywhere. So that would not be pleasant. But um, didn't even know that for you. Yeah. But anyway, it was a pretty cool project. It was very adventurous for those that were interested in getting that adventurous with it. I was not, but beautiful nonetheless. This is the native tree fern, another restoration project we were doing. Um, this, this picture always just reminds me straight out of Jurassic Park. Like you just imagine the dinosaurs just kind of chomping through, which is actually really close to where Jurassic Park was filmed, so maybe that is why it reminds me of that, but it really does look like it. Do you guys kind of agree? We just picture it in 
fern. But these are the native tree ferns, and when the British colonists came to Hawaii, they, in the center of the ferns, there's this really soft, fuzzy material that makes really awesome mattresses. So they made a lot of mattresses and killed all the trees. And so we're trying to bring them back because they're a really integral part of the ecosystem. They provide a lot of wonderful habitat. And there's a lot of erosion, and it's not why this is a problem. Um, soil generates at about one inch per 500 years, so if you're losing an inch a year, your ability to grow crops or anything on that soil is severely depleted. So it's important to keep that resource where it was, and that's really the basic thing. So the next step is I took a DC position in Virginia. Um, this is, those are sharp top and flat top pieces of water. They are right outside my window at work. They're really beautiful. Um, Virginia is a wonderful place, but I, in Virginia, I took the step from field work, which is position of a soil con or sort of soil contact, and I really stepped into management, which is what the DC is. It's more administrative, and it's very hard, kind of transitioning from a field independent person where you're out, and, you know, getting dirty, mucked up all day in your truck, you know, full of whatever you have to pick up out in the field to staying in the office and making sure that everything's functioning properly. And I think that's the hardest part going through a career is transitioning from the independent field worker to a higher functioning level within an agency, within an operation, a private sector, whatever it may be that you're working with. So that was a real struggle for the past year. And something for you guys to be aware of as you go through your career is to really prepare yourself for that. Even if it's taking over a business from a parent or taking over a, um, a management position anywhere, um, transitioning into the boss is very challenging. And you really need to be able to step up and have those communication and management leadership skills, which is important to develop now while you're here. And coming to talks like this is are great because it shows that you're open to learn. So appreciate that. So I still get to do a lot of field work um, in Virginia. This is my boss with some coworkers of mine. They're doing some surfing. And this horse is just awfully interested in what is going on there. Now this pasture was in July. Look at the productivity on there, but that's a resource concern. Grass shouldn't look like that in July. Um, it should be growing, it should be very, there should be at least this much grass. <laughs> so at least in this part of the country. And this was at a dairy. Um, it, these were the, the new calves. They were really little and curious and still looking for something that some milk is stuck on. So I'm in the bay, Chesapeake Bay, and as you guys probably know, the bay has the largest land mass that drains to it than any other water body in the world. So it's a huge resource concern, huge non-point source pollution concern, because how the heck do you control that much land base to one single point? So our, our charge in that is protecting water quality. And we do that by finding problems like this. And I don't know that you guys can see it very well in this picture, but down the hill here, there's a stream. And so all this manure is going directly into that stream, which goes directly to the bay. So these are the problems that our programs are trying to address. So Ways to deal with that are imp implementing infrastructure to handle, store, and apply that land, uh, land apply that manure at a more appropriate time of year. So this was in the winter time. So we developed structures like this: dry stack structure, dry stack structures, or waste lagoons that are um, that have proper lining, so you don't get waste lagoons spilled, which is very happen here recently. Um, so basically, a way to manage the manure so that it can be land applied and used properly, and that that, that way it doesn't become Making sense. So the next kind of step of my experience with NRCS is they really care a lot about training. And like I mentioned before, and basically what has happened is we had a bunch of field people that were hired on to provide technical assistance. And all of a sudden we needed people to run the agency. So we kind of shoved those people up into management leadership positions. All of a sudden those people are working up at headquarters. And all of a sudden we have a $14 billion budget without real strong leaders. And when we're going in and talking with the president, going in to talk to the Secretary of Ag, and handling these sorts of issues, you need somebody with strong communication and leadership skills. And the agency realized we don't really have any. And we have good leaders that are in positions now, but they were never properly trained how to communicate, how to deal with transition and change, and how to effectively um, manage something so that it operates at its most productive and efficient level. So they created this program called the Emerging Leaders Development <coughs> Program, and basically they opened it up to whoever would like to apply. And there's 70 people in the program now, and it's a two-year program. 
and it's a partnership between the Center for Excellence Public Leadership, my agency, and George Washington University. And I was fortunate enough and very thankful to be able to get selected to go into the program. And these are just some of the books that we're reading. But um, a two-year program, and we learn everything. Political savvy, how to communicate, how to play the political game up in, head, you know, up in national headquarters, how to work with landowners on, you know, from bottom-up management, basically everything there is to learn about leadership. So they really, really care about the quality of their people. They put a lot of investment into the people that work for this agency. So again, I kind of mentioned before, we have leadership that is really willing to listen because they understand their own flaws. And um, we were able to meet with the chief, some of my class members and I, and if you do notice in the back, there's that yellow sign on the chief's wall there, and that says Solar Erosion Service. And he got that for three dollars at a at a um, garage sale in Nebraska, and he's like, "That was the best three dollars I ever spent," because he's the chief of the agency, and to find an old sign like that from the '30s that says Solar Erosion Service is like finding a big chunk of gold. So he was so excited to show that to us. But the Capitol building is right behind his head, right there. But he brought us into his office, and he sat down, and he listened to us. And he said. What are the problems at the field level? Tell me what we can do to change the agency to make it more effective for our producers. What can we do to improve our product? And that says a lot to me. That says he gives a crap, which is awesome. Because how can leadership know anything if we're not communicating with us? And then the secretary, Bill Zack, you guys may or may not recognize him. Um, he came to my county like two weeks after I got there. I was like, oh my god, why is he coming to my county? Not my county. I was so nervous. Um, but he came to talk to the producers. Because about an hour south of my county, they're considering uranium mining, which is a whole other issue. But he was just kind of coming into the area to get a feel for that. But he really listened. And I don't know if he took any of that knowledge back with him. But you know, you have my chief and then his boss, boss's secretary of ag. So they're really there to listen. And I'm not sure if anything becomes of it, but at least it makes me feel better at the end of the day that I got you know, my concerns for the agency off the chest. So just a little bit about Missouri. This is, these are some, some um, stats I pulled. Um, and you guys should all know that MEMPRO is your state soil because that's important. Just like your state bird or any of the other important things you know about Missouri. Um, and MEMPRO is the soil that the state house and your the mansion, governor's mansion is built on. So that's pretty important as well. 66% um, of the acres here in Missouri are dedicated to farmland, which is awesome. Um, but it's also a, a opportunity to really work with landowners and really work with them to improve the resource that's here. 50% um, of those acres are pasture, crop, um, pasture and livestock production, and 50% are crop production. So there's really a lot of everything here. And the, the crop production is north of here, and the cattle production is in this area. So you guys are probably pretty familiar with the soils here. And they're not very fertile. So crops are hard and less fertile soils, which is where you start to get a lot of livestock production. So here are some helpful links. This is the Missouri NRCS site. Um, if you're an agricultural producer in the audience, you can go to that site and learn a lot about the programs that we have. Um, Cost share programs really improve the infrastructure on your property. Um, job postings are at USA Jobs. Is any, everybody here that is interested in the government job ever been to USA Jobs? Okay, you guys, great. So you guys need to go to this website and look up and see what's out there. And then you need to put your email so you get reminders of when jobs are posted because you need to be aware of what's out there. As a student, you guys need to understand, I get school isn't what it used to be in terms of how much it costs. And I've seen a lot of people I know go through school with degrees and things that they really want to pursue that didn't have much career opportunity at the end. And now they're stuck with all this debt and they're still working the same job they did in high school. So you really need to, to think about why you're getting the degree you're getting Look at what is required for that career and ensure that you're preparing yourself now for success when you graduate. So you do not want to be stuck with $40,000 of the debt and no job. Um, that is the worst situation to be in. And unfortunately, a lot of kids find themselves in that because they go through college somewhat lost. But even if it's something you're not all that interested in, create options for yourself. Um, maybe not in this career, but something. So that when you graduate, you have options and you can figure out what you hate and what you don't like. But you always have something to fall back on. Um, you just so important to properly structure your degree and get the most out of it. It's the biggest investment, most important investment you'll ever make. And I'm sure you guys get part of this all the time, but really take the most out of it that you can. Um, student opportunities, um, again on USA Jobs. And again, these are just federal positions. There's a whole gamut of jobs for this, working for the state, 
working for nonprofits, all of our partners. So I implore you to look those up as well. Um, and Student Information in Missouri. This is the student, and they talk about um, all the internships available this summer in Missouri. If you guys are interested in those, um, we can talk about that after. And this is the Sunset Quai. I thought it was really nice. Here's my contact information. I'm really open and willing to talk to anybody. I know how hard it is to be a student and kind of have a lot of uncertainty in the future in terms of what you want to do. So if you need anybody to talk to, please let me know. Also, if you need any help with scholarships or anything else, just kind of guiding your way through. I, I'm, I swear I'm very approachable, so just give me a buzz. And this is this picture I chose for this slide. Um, I showed up at this horse. Um, she raises gypsy gypsy banners, I think. They're show horses. They're not very suited for anything other than showing. But so this was a little pig she had in her house. And it was about this big when I first met it. And it was living in her house. And it got to be this big. And it was still living in her house. And it would bite. And, and her dogs lived outside. And I just could never understand why she had a pig inside and her dogs outside. But anyway, it really made me question my assumptions about livestock. So anyway, does anybody have any questions? Um. What courses could a uh, two-year campus like ours offer that would help uh, students join in the school year dreams? Sure. Um, I think the basic classes in the beginning, like a basic soils class, um, a basic plant taxonomy or plant biology class, um, basic wildlife biology as well. This is the career path we're interested in. Um, forestry. So in, in when I talk about soils, you can do soil taxonomy, soil quality, basic soil erosion processes, there's a lot of different. There's also crop production classes that are more closely related to ag degrees. What are the degrees in here? Do you guys have ag? Okay, and then some environmental science or not so much. Any engineering? No engineering. All right, one engineer. Cool. All right. We <laughs> so, have at least one soil class. You have one soil class? Wonderful. Take that class. <laughs> if this is something you're interested in, it's, it'll be worth your money, I can swear. Money and gold. Any other questions? I listen to you on the radio yesterday. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I'm not a student. I'm a pillow farmer. And, uh, I'm sorry, what? You mentioned, you mentioned that there were uh, specialty uh, crops that uh, are coming into existence, uh, and I was wondering if you might give some some information on that. Sure, um, we have um, a couple of programs targeted to help landowners start to get more into specialty crop production, um, and that's related to our high tunnel program. And we have cost share incentive rates to help landowners install high tunnel. So basically, a high tunnel is a mobile greenhouse structure that is about six feet tall. You probably know that. But the purpose of it is to extend the growing season, to open the opportunity to grow all sorts of different vegetables, um, really expand their, their ability to grow different um, uh, specialty crops, like specialty greens, microgreens, those kinds of things. So that's the, that's our charge in that mission. We also have beginning farmer initiatives for people are, that have bought land within the past 10 years and are really trying to get started. And there's a variety of different energy and infrastructure to help um, assistance that we can do in that, as well as um, organic. If somebody wants to transition to organic, we have programs for that as well. And I know that they're really trying to work to create, um, not my agency, but there are coalitions that are starting to create local markets and market development, so that not only are people getting into these niche markets to, create micro, to grow microgreens or heirloom tomatoes or whatever it is they may grow, but find a place to really to sell them. And that's the most important outcome, is that they have somewhere an outlet to bring this produce into the world. So, does that answer your question? No? Okay, can you, you want to ask, try it again? Well, uh, can you list or, or mention some of the specialty crops that are, that are coming into the world as far as, uh, like one of the things I look at are elderberries. That's, that's I got you. Okay. I, I don't know too much about what, the area, um, unfortunately, but I do know that there's a big grape industry that's starting to come about. A lot of different berries people are growing, like elderberries, strawberries. Um, and those can all be done under the high tunnel program. Um, where I'm from, some of the specialty things that are starting to be grown are ginger. There's a lot of ginger farmers coming into play. Ginger is becoming this big antioxidant kind of 
produce that everybody wants to buy. Um, but all sorts of different vegetables, really, that are for niche markets, like organic radishes, turnips, broccoli, all sorts of different heirloom broccoli varieties, heirloom tomato varieties, microgreens in terms of arugula, baby spinach, so many different. Basically, a lot of different vegetables that aren't the norm, like bok choy. Um, those are the markets that really are targeted, I think, for the people that are out there that are really becoming health conscious and want a large variety of vegetables at different times of the year. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> is there is there a size of a farm that qualifies for health agency? The only qualification um, to enroll in one of our programs is you have to make a thousand dollars a year in agricultural income, and you have to be able to prove that. But other than that, that's really the only size doesn't matter. We want to work with small scale producers. One farmer I work with in Virginia has four goats and about 20 chickens, and that's his operation, and he's making money, and he's selling that, and that's totally justifiable. So basically, it's just the income requirement to show that you are generating an income. An and it's not necessarily an income, but it can also be you produce $1,000 worth of something. You may not have sold it, but you have records to show that you produced it. So that's the requirement. Yes, sir? For the type of soil that we have in if any one of us just wants to go in our backyard and plant a little garden, best way to treat your little plot for your garden so that this type of soil will be productive? Well, the first thing you should do is check out web soil survey and you can get yourself a nice soil map for your property. And you can know the soil texture that will tell you how much water is available for your plants, the type of plants that will grow best, and any limitations if there's a high water table, if it's, if it's shallow, you know, quick to bedrock, those kinds of things. So that's really the first thing you should do. But with gardening, there's always the typical amendments. You can bring in manure, compost, you can do compost at home. Um, basic nutrient management in terms of what you're putting in there. Plants have specific needs and what they in terms of what they need and be able to address all of those needs. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I think the compost is growing. Yeah, the compost is really. You need to understand what's out there and what you're trying to grow. And if it's a small garden, bring in compost. It's not going to cost that much. If you're talking large scale crop production on hundreds of acres, you're obviously not going to bring in compost <laughs> for that. It's a whole different issue. Okay, right. we good? One more question. Yes, um, I've enjoyed your presentation. Excellent presentation, excellent slides, and excellent photographs. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I have one question for you. Sure. Uh, do you have collaboration with the uh, African countries? We um, we do work in other countries that, uh, outside of the U.S. Right now we have programs to send DCs and technicians and engineers to Afghanistan to rehabilitate their agricultural infrastructure. Um, we also have some programs in Nicaragua, Mexico, and uh, the Dominican Republic. So it's basically a partnership at the national level where our chief or the Secretary of Ag has determined that there is going to be some sort of partnership and we can send people safely to work in these areas. Um, in terms of Kenya, there are some really innovative grazing producers that have come to the U.S. to talk about their really innovative approach to ecological systems and grazing. And I had the opportunity to see, I can't recall his name, but he came out to speak with some of my producers and really amazing stuff. I mean, things that are typical grazing operators think are weeds. He's like, no, your cattle can eat this. It has like 19% protein. This is forage. And he's like, you need to look at how you understand forage. And he was really amazing and was like, you're going to save yourself so much money. You won't have to put pesticides out. You just need to train your cows to eat everything out there and do that by intensive rotational grazing. So that was really interesting. So I hope to learn more about the agriculture that's kind of around different parts of the world. Does that answer? Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm answering. I feel like I'm bad. But any other questions? Yes. One more. Sure. Um, I noticed a uh, list of some organizations there. Let's see. Uh, the, what are the other uh, The Nature Conservancy? The Native American organization. Is oh, yes. The Native organization or a sister So basically, we have these nonprofit organizations that were created by employees of the agency, um, and the Native American organization is one of them. So we have employees that on their off hours are the president and they run these organizations and then they hold conferences to provide training to the employees that are within the agency as a whole. So they're they're kind of not connected in terms of it, but they're run by our employees. And they're really meant to provide training opportunities to provide cultural awareness of the rest of the agency and to provide for our um, 
Because the state agency was running as a good old boy system for a long time, and if you weren't in that good old boy system, you really couldn't advance in terms of your career. So these groups are really as a way to try to help bring the agency together as a whole and to provide a network for everyone to be part of. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, everyone.